Uh, hello everyone, welcome to Dublin. That room is kind of big, like I thought I would present in a much, much smaller room. A lot less people less crowded, but it's still fun. So I hope everyone had a, a safe travel despite all of the well, mess at the Dublin airport that was yesterday. So, uh, briefly, this is the agenda. This is next uh, half an hour. Uh, this stuff we will be discussing, um, hopefully will be interesting. And so, so far that you we only have half an hour, so let's start. So, um, I was always wondering, what motivates me to like work after hours, to work really, really uh, long weekends sometimes? Um, why like I enjoy enjoy this work? Um, and sometimes, like I'm looking at the patches, and the work feels feels like a chore. So it's this um, elusive state of flow. As people are saying, being in the zone, uh, it's a state of uh, complete immersion in the activity. So how I can be in that flow state more often? Many books have written on this subject, and one of them is called Start with the Why. I uh, highly recommend this book. Um, what I have, like, yeah, it, you can uh, like, agree and disagree that I was a pros and cons. So I'm not saying it's perfect, but what I realized that clarity of the personal mission, mission is number one reason to actually like, enjoy the work. So, uh, what, what is this uh, mission statement? Like, why would you uh, connect to it? Like, to just give you a few examples, like, you can read the Tesla or Google's mission. Uh, here, I won't uh, repeat what they say, but the, the mission is a precise description of why companies, uh, open source projects, and people uh, do what they do. So, I do believe that, like, having a mission statement is, like, really what motivates you to do stuff. The reasons to have a mission. So it first of all allows um, leaders of, and, and here was important. So this is I just took like from Wikipedia. The reasons to have a mission statement. It applies to companies, but uh, what I'm trying to say here that it equally applies to any open source projects. In this case, like we're all working like here at least a lot of folks in this row are working on the Linux kernel. So it applies like leaders here substituted with maintainers. It allows maintainers to stay focused. It allows developers to understand the value why they work on the Linux kernel. It allows like new recruits to the to the community. And at the end, it allows like individual developers to see the connection with something like big that uh, people are working on. So then going to so the last part is important. Allows individuals to uh, connect to the to the bigger mission of the project. So here, um, individual, like in this case, like me, uh, needs, to, needs to have like really uh, clarity of what's, um, why, like why I wake up like in the morning sometimes like super excited to like to do the work. So I knew I like, like programming, I knew like I like coding, but still like one day you code and you feel like, well, it sucks. And sometimes you're like really in the flow, you like time flies. So, and I've started like discovering like what's, uh, what motivates me. So, what I find out is this, well, it may sound like grandiose, but my, my own like mission statement is to innovate and enable others to innovate. It took me <clears throat> several months, to be honest, to figure out, to figure out this uh, little, little sentence. What I discovered that you cannot just invent it. You cannot say, well, this is, like, I like the statement, that's why, like, this is what I'm doing. Like, this mission statement it has to be, like, discovered. Like, I may be looking at, let's say, like, Tesla's company mission statement, it may sound, like, nice, but it will not be really me. Uh, it took me a while, but then, like, I got it. And once I started connected, like, this is actually what, like, BPF is about. Like, BPF is a technology, it enables innovation. Like, it satisfies, like, once I figure out, like, I just discovered my own mission statement, I understood, like, why BPF is such a thing that, like, drives me, drives me to work. Um, it's uh, um, my own thirst for innovation that enables others to innovate. That's also 
like unbelievable. Like when you are like working on something and you have an ability to help developers, to help like new people to like achieve the uh, insight. So they come to you, they say, well, I want to work on this something big. And you help them to just to like achieve this. It's like, it's such a satisfaction. Um, that's why I really work on Blue here. So, uh, well, that's all just me saying, like, it's all like hand baby. But let's look at more uh, hard data to, well, to hopefully convince you that indeed there is an innovation in the VPF kernel subsystem. So this is a graph of emails that we have, emails and patches in the uh, VPF mainly list over the last three years. Um, the lower line is the uh, Facebook VPF uh, team, the folks from Facebook that, that contributed, and the blue line is the rest of the VPF community, like everyone who sends the patches. And <laughs> Last couple of weeks on the, on the mailing list, I felt that I'm like swamped. Like there are so many emails, so many patches, and it felt that well, it looks like the, the community is growing. But so that's why I took their uh, data to really prove it. Like you can see in August, in August we had 70 emails a day on average on the mailing list that we had to process. And look at the, over the last three years, it was <laughs> no less than 50. So this is just a huge amount of traffic. Another, another graph to like, prove that the community is still growing. This is number of developers per month. Uh, over the last three years, the Facebook uh, folks like, stayed like, around like, 10, 10 to 15 people, uh, while the rest of the community like, grew. You can see like, almost like linear line of people. Uh, now we have what, 110, 110 around different, different folks in months that like contribute either, either, either to a discussion or patches on the mailing list. I think this is just like nothing short of amazing. Like this is why I love the job that I'm, I love my job. BPF uh, enables innovation in the applications as well, not only, not only in the Linux kernel. So I took this uh, screenshot of the, uh, from the web page at BPF.io. Uh, there are like so many exciting projects here, and I wish I had time to like see, like, be more involved in terms of uh, what they do. But so far, but they're fun. So in this particular case, I want to just look into one of them, which is uh, Katran. It's a um, layer four load balancer that initially was created in Facebook and is still like in uh, full production use uh, today. So every cat picture that people look, every uh, phone conversation, not phone conversation, every messaging conversation, like what's up and everything else, it goes through this layer full uh, balancer that sits and deployed everywhere across the world. And what's interesting part of it is that it's written in, uh, in BPF. The packet, packet processing pipeline is in BPF and this is the true screenshot of the entry, uh, the first uh, function that starts like processing every packet in the world. Um, and it's actually like really simple. Uh, why I'm bringing this up here? Because it's written in so called, as we were calling, calling back then, eight years ago, a restricted C. When VPF started it was um, restricted C and folks were asking, what is this restricted C? What's so special about it? Can you define it in the main page? And I was just like, saying, well, I don't know, like, it's kind of C, it has some restrictions, but what, what those restrictions are. So the way it was designed is uh, we had fixed uh, input context, in this case for the XDP it has one, um, and fixed a set of return codes. It was all great, but with this early days of this restricted C, what it meant that, like, you probably, like, so if you, if you use VPF everywhere, we had to use uh, always in line because all of the functions we had to combine to the one function that would be presented as a one program to the kernel. Then the function had to have like one argument, and because like we didn't want to expose the kernel internals, we created this abstraction of uh, context where, in case of like socket buffer, it will be like underscore underscore ASCII buff. Now it looks, I think, ugly. There's two underscores, but back then it looked like reasonable because in kernel we have like UCT2, which is kernel, underscore underscore UCT2, which will be user space, and here underscore underscore is kebab, supposed to mean the user space representation is kebab. But 
if we didn't follow this convention later. And back then there were no loops, uh, no global variables, no functions, no really, no memory allocation, no tax. So it was indeed this restricted C in some uh, interesting ways. And over the last years, we were marching towards supporting 100% of the normal C. We added uh, global study function verification. Now, LibPF works as a linker. Um, is a linker just as well, so we can start building libraries just like uh, glibc, glibc equivalent in the VPF world. We're not yet there yet, but we're getting. Um, from no loops, we have now three kind of different uh, variants of the loops. Bounded loops, we have uh, loop helpers, we have a for each uh, accessors, we have uh, iterators, and all kind of different stuff. So sorry. But what's interesting here is like in early days of VPF, with this restricted C, we had the concept of this context, this underscore is keep up. Whereas now we are moving towards the uh, compile once everywhere approach, which allows us to uh, be like more flexible and more extensible much faster. Um, how is this achieved? So we were like, struggling so like one of the reasons like restricted c was c because like because of the safety like vpf has to be safe and in this case not only safe it has to be like portable so we couldn't really um, stay within the boundaries of what c language allows us to do and we started extended it, extending it so the whole um compile once run everywhere concept and relies on the way we compile the programs. And in this case, this was our first extension to the C language. We had an attribute that called reserve access index. And when you compile um, a code, a structure that's marked like this, compiler, in this case, like LLVM and GCC, I don't think GCC supports it, but the LLVM, it makes the field accesses instead of like fixed offset, it makes them symbolic accesses. And this is this is a generic concept. It's not necessarily like liable to VPF. So this extension actually works. Well, no, it doesn't work for x86, but it's done through the front end. So there is a little bit of plumbing necessary on the on the back end side. But in general, it's a new concept in the C language. It's a true C extension that makes the structure layout dynamic. And that's what allows this core as a concept to even work. Then we didn't stop there, we uh, figured that, well, the C language will benefit from things like uh, type information. You can roughly compare it to the um, uh, RTTI and C++ and other languages, but here it's built in. And again, this is done through the extensions to the language technically, uh, where we can say, we can just ask like, what's the type, type ID of the, uh, let's say, struct that's keep off inside the kernel. Uh, and we can use this type to actually print, print the structures, this example of, of uh, SN printf. We can ask what's the size of the structure, in this case, like struct, struct uh, task struct. Um, what's interesting here, uh, that the type size uh, macro, it will, will be resolved at the load time, not at the, and not at the compilation. At compilation, we'll just wrap the whole stuff in a special things in a relocation. Uh, it's a combination between like, object files, but I won't go into too much details there. But the, it, the language is being extended as a combination of the compiler and the runtime, with things like size of the structure, where the type even exists in the kernel. They all, they all determined at the, at, the, at the lower time. It all feels so far like I'm not connecting to, this, to, to the exact use cases, but is this just like examples of how the language is being extended? Then we extended it with, with a key configs. Uh, comparing to kernel modules, like kernel modules can like, have access to kernel configuration as well. Here, the difference that the things like what is the current uh, hertz uh, that this particular running kernel has as a definition, or what's a uh, Linux kernel version of that will be again determined at the lower time, not the compilation time. So at compilation time, the program can be just like compiled once, and then depending on the box, uh, it will get adjusted while, while being loaded. Um, then we, we did even more fun stuff. Uh, we've extended um, C language with a sort of like uh, uh, exception throw 
concept, but here, like the C language doesn't have the catch statement, but it can throw, and the throw will be like automatically mitigated. Uh, in the C, it does look like this SKB reference of def pointer and then uh, accessing another field. Um, it will look in the generated code, it will be still a single load instructions that later will be converted into like load instruction plus two, uh, two branches by the JITs uh, in the kernel. And in addition, there will be so-called exception tables automatically generated and given to the kernel. So when there is actually like a fault, when the kernel doesn't have this other is like accessing null or something, like it's instead of like faulting and crashing the kernel, it will just gently will reach on zero and this is how the whole thing like works. So it roughly equivalent to the copy copy um, probrit kernel um, accesses us and the kernel, but done as the inline function. So not even function, it's just like a single load plus a few branches. So it's pretty fast. Um, then uh, there are other interesting pieces in, in the C language. There is a uh, so-called type and um, declaration tagging that we added. And for example, if the kernel is compiled with Clang today, the underscore underscore user, if you like worked on the kernel in the past, a user and per CPU uh, tags that will be on the types, they would be they were meaningful only for sparse uh, since, uh, static checker in the past. Now they're actually used for real. When Clang compiles the whole kernel, these types will go all the way through the dwarf, eventually in BTF and eventually in BTF, and will stay there. So when the fire sees it, it actually can enforce the right access. If it's marked user, it will only be like through the appropriate uh, user user helpers. Uh, now we're <laughs> getting into uh, somewhat crazy territory. Uh, we now extending C language with the concept of the operator new uh, from the uh, C++ where we add in a type enforced um, allocation of the objects. We're not like in the normal C, of course you have malloc in the C++ you have like operator new uh, that like allocates memory and this memory can be essentially like void star. It's up to the compiler, but you can have like typecast and then access something you allocate to completely different. In the BTF land with this like C extensions, we will be allocating objects that only of specific type. Like this KPTR new will return this foo and you can only access it as a foo. You can like in C typecast it to a different object, but during the load time, verifier will prevent the success. So it's all, all in the name of the safety. And um, the concept, and we also already introduced the concept of the KPTR, which is a kernel pointer. There are like two different KPTR and KPTR reference. Uh, they're somewhat similar to the unique pointers uh, in C++, and I forgot how the concept is called in Rust. But essentially the idea that only one entity, like there's only, only one uh, sort of thread owns the pointer, and you can like atomically exchange it in and out of the maps and different CPUs can like, because there's only one ownership, like they don't need to like do any kind of locking when access the object because they are only owners of this stuff. So what it allows to do is for example, to do um, maps with a variable length uh, arrays uh, and like store strings, for example, like allocate the string, store it somewhere, then use it later. So this is like all super exciting and uh, very new. Uh, the latest things that are also like in the works right now, we add in the concept of the statically checked uh, locks to the to the language and things like uh, blink list and arbitraries with the goal of being able to construct pretty complex uh, data structures and all inside all inside the programs. In the past, that was unthinkable, I would say. When the PF was just created, it was, the maps were used as a combination of both like allocator and the data structure. Here we're separating allocator as a small individual building blocks, then link list as the simplest like building block as well with arbitraries and everything else that is, that is coming. So the programmers will have won't be limited to like a basic data structures, but it will be a lot more powerful. 
Um, another thing that we're considering is to have the concept of the assertions in the language. So what we found that like, that's probably like number one complaint that people say about VPF that the verifier is uh, too dumb. Like I'm writing the program and it's like, it's obvious that well, I know what I'm doing. It has to understand it, but well, computers are not perfect. So uh, we're going to introduce the assertions and in the first place they will help uh, this combination of the compiler user and the verifier when the user can say, I know, I well, because I wrote this program this way, like in this particular example, like I sort within will tell me, will I'm telling the uh, verifier and the whole like PPF subsystem that my uh, word pointer is within this uh, uh, range. So it is like, and if it, if it is not, then please abort this program as a whole thing because this should never happen. So it's very similar to assertions in, in like normal user space in C where you just like core dump and shouldn't happen. But here it's sort of in between helping verify on one side to understand that this next like uh, read modify write operation is safe, is within the bounds. And the second time it's like moving. So anyway, we'll see. It's, it's really definitely gonna be like fun to implement because it involves uh, unwinding the stack safely and like calling all of the destructors and this I just showed you how we'll have the operator new, so there will be destructors that we call during this. Uh, but at the end, hopefully, it will look look like this. So yeah, well, this I think I already mentioned. So like just a normal example of the typecast. You can typecast and see C plus plus, and all the things might crash, or do like double free. It's not okay in in VPF. So this is. Um, when people say, well, it is restricted C, yes, it is restricted C, but it's restricted for the purpose of being safe. Okay, so this is this is a comparison where we were, like eight years ago, what they call the early days of VPF and, and today. And I think um, there were some uh, interesting threads uh, where people were saying, well, what is, what is really VPF? Like what's... Uh, and I think it's still not clear to many where we stand, whether whether VPF has a stable API or what's unstable part of it, like how it can affect the kernel, how it, whether like what what is actually happening. So this slide is supposed to answer it. In early days, we were thinking as VPF as a system that um, similar to what we knew before, like uh, classic VPF, where you have a stable uh, instruction set and the API. There is like a protocol between kernel and user space that kernel promises not to break. And this is how extended VPF was done as well. That's why this whole concept of the context and return values, we made them stable. We promised that they're stable. We maintain this backward compatibility um, through this UAPI VPF that age. And this is we still maintain, of course. Um, what we realized that this is actually not uh, enough, for example, for tracing. Tracing, like it needs to look into in, inside inside the kernel and in other cases. So like in the modern day VPF, like we have uh, sleepable and non-sleepable. Now we have, uh, instead of single context, we have multiple. The functions can see the types. The verifier will do the type matching. Then uh, extensions to the, like hooks are no longer like done as uh, hooks. Uh, stable hooks, like the last ones, I think, I think we added were like some on the network inside that was C group based uh, stuff. Now we don't do them anymore. anymore. Why? Because we can connect the kernel with VPF in an unstable way through just adding an empty function. It's so like an empty no inline function can be removed. And we did it. So like we have examples where we, uh, what's already in the tree is a connection between like VPF and a connection tracker. And over the last like release, we already changed how this uh, functions look like and what VPF, where it can attach sort of and what, what it can, can get called. And we're working on what they call here is scattered like knob five is the ability to put this uh, hooks uh, anywhere, not only at the beginning of a function, but anywhere. And the way it like look in assembly is just like a knob where there is nothing else but the knob there. And if you will be able to just like put stuff in there, collect everything in a nice way and, and get out. So like 
here it's on one side some of the VPF programs, especially this old classic sort of networking like Catran, uh, Catran led layer four load balancer I showed you earlier, is looks more like this user space like, whereas uh, different kinds of VPF program they're really more similar to the kernel modules where they have like unstable where they tightly integrated with the kernel they read everything they see the whole kernel and they pretty much can call um, into a bunch of things so um, since i was talking so much about kernel modules like it's obvious that they are not safe uh, they're not really portable this whole DKMS stuff is, well, compiler and a host of um, security reasons, it's not great. And what uh, sometimes people say, well, VPF is such a, like programs uh, uh, blobs, but like looking at the, comparing them to the kernel modules, kernel modules are really the blobs, like they're binary, like there is pretty much like zero visibility in terms of what they do. Whereas, like this modern day VPF programs, they're pretty much like kernel modules, but they're safe and portable. And portability is not guaranteed, as I was saying, but there are, we provide the tools to make them portable, to make them easier to be portable between different kernels. So this uh, compile once everywhere concept and uh, this preserve access index feature where compilation makes the symbolic accesses, this just allows the end type uh, dynamic checking of the type allows the programs to be written in a portable way, but they are not guaranteed to be so. And of course, like mm -hmm. unlike the kernel module, the whole thing is way more debuggable uh, because the types are always built in. Like people can just like look at what all the maps contain based on the name of the fields and so on and so forth. And we also embed the source code in the in the binary like by default and unconditional. And it's possible to like dissolve well to like really it's kind of hard to even remove this too so like when you compile a program your code will be there and uh the conscious choice that we decided to do is that, like this new kind of vpf programs it's always uh gpl only like in the kernel space in the, for the kernel modules you have export symbol gpl versus export symbol whereas here we're just saying the k funks what's it called the uh, kernel functions this is list, this is uh, whitelisted helpers, kind of, uh, that the VF programs can call. So all of them are equivalent to export civil GPL only. So uh, I hope uh, some of these examples made you think, well, uh, oh, I hope I convinced you that uh, this VPFC is the better choice for the as a language for uh, programming and developing the kernel. But um, the part that was, I think, like, uh, is still, uh, that I think actually Benjamin probably will explain better in his presentation that coming right after. But uh, the way we're trying to develop the, aiming for the BPF system to work is to make it into the to make it a tool, a tool out of it, something that any other subsystem can use without actually like sending emails to like VPF mailing list and talking to us. Like if there is anything in the verifier, we'll help you to add it. Uh, I think we've added everything that the uh, hit subsystem wants on the verifier side. So now it's up to um, human interface devices to define how this, how they can use VPF. And same applies to like any other subsystem. I think last night I saw somebody like from Google sending patches to use VPF in uh, multi-generational RU or something like this, where it was like also like no VPF, no core VPF changes, but another subsystem like would be able to like become more like programmable with the help of VPF. And then this other subsystem can decide whether they will stay like completely um, this kernel dependent or they want to provide some sort of API like guarantees, at least like not breaking. So now it will be a choice of the subsystem whether it will be like stable or not. And with this, I'm done and I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, hi, Ted Cho. Uh, so I'm curious whether you've had any thoughts about how do we manage user expectations about whether a particular uh, BPF program is supposed to be more like a modern BPF where it's like a kernel module, there is no portability guarantees whatsoever, or classic eBPF where it's more like user space and there is a better guarantee of uh, compatibility between kernel versions. Because, you know, we can make this policy statement, it makes sense to me, but how do we make sure that users of eBPF programs understand this distinction? Right, so yeah, excellent question. So we were not, uh, yes, documentation is definitely like uh, <laughs> our weak point, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and like what we discussed, we, we're going to uh, document in this UI, UAPI BPO.h which program type is like old style or the new ones, because it is the case already today, like when people doing like XDP style program, it is this more user space like uh, with a guaranteed API. Whereas like all of the programs that are like proc type tracing, LSM programs like included, they're really this on the right side. and. They actually like don't really. There is no like program type that in the boss camp. So it's really binary when you look at the program types there. And for the for the new VPA uh, programs, we're not going to be adding most likely any more program types. So it will be hopefully much more obvious what it is today. Right now, unfortunately, it's like yeah, without documentation, it's hard to tell unless you like really know uh, involved in the VPA. But it's so, so the recommendation I'd make is documentation is great for developers. For end users, it might be interesting to think about, you know, are there ways you can work with the package managers so the package advertises, you know, what the compatibility guarantees are, right? And even so, package, package like yeah, RPM I mean, and yeah. What I'm saying is it's it's more about the communication outbound to end users, not just documentation, right? Both are important. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if end users start complaining that eBPF, you know, this particular eBPF package that has been, you know, shipped by Red Hat Enterprise Linux all over the world is no longer, uh, you know, backwards compatible and they complain to Linus, mm -hmm. it would be nice if there was a way to point that, you know, people missed all of the signs that said this is a kernel module thing, not a user space thing. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's 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 documentation is important, but I would encourage folks to think beyond that, just to you know avoid confusion. Right, you need to over communicate. Thank you. Um, so I think this is an interesting thing that Ted brought up. Right, like if packages in Linux start shipping with eBPF programs now, they are already, uh, and they they know this way where you can reverse chronologically, like add VPF programs. And since the logic is shipping with the application, it is much easier to do than with kernel modules. You preach into the choir. But like, we need to write this down on how to roll out. The project leaf was one example where this could be laid out properly, that this is how you load, but other areas we should document or yep, like. Yep. I think there was a few more questions here. And we're probably last question since we're really out of time. Okay, um, you mentioned very briefly statically checked locks. What's statically checked about them? Yes. What are you checking? Uh, that's a long topic. Yes, like it's 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 absolutely uh, well. It's still work 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 in progress, but we think we know how to do the uh, statically checked locks. Uh, well, we actually have both static and dynamic, uh, but it's. I can spend half an hour just talking about it. So uh, let's definitely talk about it more, but probably like uh, offline. And I'm of course available for everyone. I'm here all four days, so catch me in the, in the hallway. If you can validate the, the locking that exists in the code, you could theoretically automatically generate locking as well. Uh, sorry. So if you had like some attributes that say, okay, this data type is protected by this lock, the verifier oh, yes. could automatically generate the locking. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're going for. Like we'll have the lock and like the, roughly the concept, like we have the, uh, we'll have the concept of allocation uh, where uh, lock 
and the stuff like link list, the arbitrary or fields, they come together as part of single allocation. But the single allocation, the single like KPTR new is a new operation. So the lock and the field that it protects to, they come together. And because of this, like we know what is guarded by what, but in some cases we cannot. So we'll have the type tagging, well, kind of type tagging, like using the Jekyll and type tagging extensions that we added to see to use that to say that this field is actually protected by this lock or this link list is protected by this lock. Then the verifier can enforce all of this static. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. All right, thank you very much, Alexi. Uh, we owe a lot of gratitude towards you.